by the Nine Divines. The Day of Reckoning is upon us. It is time for us all to achieve Kim. With these 36 lessons, each and every one of us gathered here today shall ascend to Aetherius and beyond. Will you gaze upon the Orbis from above and see the universe for what it truly is? Will you wake up from the Godhead's dream and become an Amaranth, a dreamer? Or will your mind burst from the sheer mass of revelation, vanishing from existence in a magnificently anticlimactic zero sum? Come with me on a journey of enlightenment, and I will show you the secret syllable of royalty, as written by the warrior poet himself. This series has been a long time coming, but even for a daedrologist like me, who spends the bulk of his waking hours slumped over dense tattered tomes, flicking through pillars of frayed parchment, trying to unravel the mysteries of the Daedra Lords, this is quite the undertaking. Vivek's sermons are notoriously cryptic, with lore spanning from the supernatural to the downright strange. But we're going to explain it all, no matter how bizarre. Vivek learned the secrets of the Orbis, and his enormous ego allowed him to continue to exist, while simultaneously learning that he doesn't truly exist. These kinds of discoveries can break any mortal psyche, and despite his brilliance, there is no doubt that this living god's wheel has a few spokes loose. This is going to be a long journey, and in order to leave no stones unturned, I think each sermon will require an entire video. I'll recite each lesson, and then break it down afterward. So I won't spend any more time setting the scene. Let's get right to the beginning of Vivek's story, in Sermon 1, to a secluded little Necherman's village, where a young Vek was supposedly born. He was born in the ash among the Velofi, a non kaima before the war with the Northern Men. A.M. came first to the village of the Necherman, and her shadow was that of Boethia, who was the prince of plots, and things unknown and known would fold themselves around her until they were like stars or the messages of stars. A.M. took a Necherman's wife and said, I am the face-snaked queen of the three in one. In you is an image and a seven-syllable spell, A.M. A. Seti A. Vec, which you will repeat to it until mystery comes. Then, A.M. threw the Necherman's wife into the ocean water, where dregs took her into castles of glass and coral. They gifted the Necherman's wife with gills and milk fingers, changing her sex so that she might give birth to the image as an egg. There she stayed for seven or eight months. Then Set came to the Necherman's wife and said, I am the clockwork king of the three in one. In you is an egg of my brother sister, who possesses invisible knowledge of words and swords, which you shall nurture until the Hortator comes. And Set then extended his hands, and multitudes of homunculi came forth, each like a glimmering rope through water, and they raised the Necherman's wife back to the surface world, and set her down on the shoals of Azura's coast. There she lay for seven or eight more months, caring for the egg knowledge by whispering to it the codes of Mafala and the prophecies of Velof, and even the forbidden teachings of Trinomac. Seven Daedra came to her one night, and each one gave to the egg new motions that could be achieved by certain movements of the bones. These are called the barons of move like this. Then an eighth Daedroth came, and he was a demi-prince, called Fa Nui Hen, or the multiplier of motions known. And Fa Nui Hen said, Whom do you wait for? To which the Necherman's wife said, The Hortator. Go to the land of the Inderil in three months' time, for that is when war comes. I return now to haunt the warriors who fell and still wonder why. But first I show you this. Then the barons and the demi-prince joined together into a pillar of fighting styles terrible to behold, and they danced before the egg and its learning image. Look, little Vec, and find the face behind the splendour of my bladed carriage, for in it is delivered the unmixed conflict path, perfect in every way. What is its number? It is said the number is the number of birds that can nest in an ancient Tibral tree, less free grams of honest work. But Vivek in his later years found a better one, and so gave this secret to his people. For I have crushed a world with my left hand, he will say, but in my right hand is how it could have won against me. Love is under my will only. The ending of the words is Almsavi. He was born in the ash among the Velofi, a non kaima before the war with the northern men. Vivek was born in Morrowind, back when the Dunma were the Kaima, 
After Boethia exposed the lies of Trinimac and showed the gathered mortals the triangled truth, the Chima became an offshoot of the Oldmer of Somerset. The Chima, or Changed Ones, followed the Prophet Veloth across Tamriel until they reached Resdane. Thus, Vivek was born among the Velofi. The war with the Northern Men could be misconstrued as referring to the War of the First Council in First Era 700, as the Nords under the leadership of High King Wolfarth entered the fray to reclaim the Heart of Shaw. But it actually refers to the occupation of mainland Morrowind by the First Empire of the Nords. In First Era 240, High King Vraga began a campaign to conquer Resdane and trounce the Velofi defenders. The Nords occupied the lands for almost 200 years, until the Chimer and Dwemer made an alliance to push out the Northmen in First Era 416. I should note that the main catalyst for the defeat of the Nords was actually the fracturing of the Nordic Empire. After the death of High King Borgus, the War of Succession broke out, and infighting prevented the Nords from properly maintaining their vassal states in High Rock, Cyrodiil and Morrowind. A.M. came first to the village of the Netcherman, and her shadow was that of Boethia, who was the Prince of Plots, and things unknown and known would fold themselves around her until they were like stars or the messages of stars. A.M. took a Netcherman's wife and said, I am the face-snaked queen of the three in one. In you is an image and a seven-syllable spell, A.M. A. Seti A. Vec, which you will repeat to it until mystery comes. A.M., which is the Daedric letter A, refers to Almalexia, who was anticipated by Boethia of the good Daedra. She came to the Netcherman village and told the Netcherman's wife that she is the face-snaked queen of the free in one Boethia is commonly associated with snakes. Her plane of oblivion is snake mount, and her sigil shows a snake coiled around an upraised fist. The importance of the snake to Boethia is another video subject entirely. But in short, it represents her love for Lorcan, the Daedric Prince of Mundus. The three in one, of course, refers to the tribunal, and the seven syllable spell, A M A Seti A Vec, which in Elnafek says A and S and V, refers to Almalexia, Sophosil, and Vivek. And the mystery she refers to is Sophosil. Then, A.M. threw the Netcherman's wife into the ocean water, where the dregs took her into castles of glass and coral. They gifted the Netcherman's wife with gills and milk fingers, changing her sex so that she might give birth to the image as an egg. There she stayed for seven or eight months. Now this is where things get weird. You might have seen the initial parallels between Vivek's origins and the immaculate birth of Jesus in the Christian faith. Almalexia came to a humble net shepherd and his wife, and perhaps she would have conceived a child who would become Vivek. However, Almalexia tossed the woman into the ocean as an offering to the dregs. The dregs are commonly known for being aggressive crustaceans, without much going on beneath their carapaces. But the water dregs are believed to be very intelligent, or at least they once were in a previous cowper when they ruled the slave oceans as barbarous tyrants. The dregs gave the Netcherman's wife the ability to incubate an egg. They gave her gills and milk fingers. And as we'll learn later in Vivek's sermons, a milk finger is exactly what you think it is. Vivek, like his anticipation Mafala, is a hermaphrodite. He has a male and female side, and is full of dichotomies. Sophosil says, Vivek craves radical freedom, the death of limits and restrictions. He wishes to be all things at all times, every race, every gender, every hero, both divine and finite. But in the end, he can only be Vivek. Some crustaceans in the real world are hermaphrodites, and some even change gender over their life cycle. This is part of why it was so important for Vivek's mother to be altered by the dregs in their aquatic kingdoms. There will be more dreg talk throughout the series, but for now, we need only know that Vivek was to be hatched from an egg. Then Set came to the Netcherman's wife and said, I am the Clockwork King of the Free in One. In you is an egg of my brother sister, who possesses invisible knowledge of words and swords, which you shall nurture until the Hortator comes. Next came Set, or Sophosil. There seems to be two contradictory accounts of how Vivek and Sophosil met. One claims that Vivek rescued Sophosil from Old Sofa after the settlement was destroyed by Merun's Dagon. However, Sermon 1 suggests that Set was already the clockwork king of the Free in One before Vivek's birth. Is this story actually a metaphor for Vivek's rebirth on his path to enlightenment?
Vivek possesses knowledge of words and swords because he is the warrior poet, the middle ground between the warrior and the mage, between A.M. and Set. The Hortator is a specific role in Chimeri Great House culture, where each of the Great Houses agrees to allow one individual to lead them into battle. In this case, the Hortator is Indiril Nerevar, Almalexia's husband. And Set then extended his hands and multitudes of homunculi came forth, each like a glimmering rope through the water, and they raised the Nechiman's wife back to the surface world and set her down on the shoals of Azura's coast. There she lay for seven or eight more months, caring for the egg knowledge by whispering to it the codes of Mafala and the prophecies of Veloth, and even the forbidden teachings of Trinamak. Now, in real-world history, before we had any understanding of the birds and the bees, a homunculus was believed to be a microscopic human being from which a fetus developed. So, in this context, Sophocil fertilized the egg that the Nechiman's wife was carrying. She was then taken from the domain of the dregs and returned to Azura's coast. She then proceeded to encant the wisdom of the good Daedra to her unborn child. Seven Daedra came to her one night, and each one gave to the egg new motions that could be achieved by certain movements of the bones. These are called the barons of move like this. This part is particularly hard to decipher, but on the surface, it appears as though the Seven Daedra taught the unborn Vivek the arts of war. When meeting Cyrus the Redguard later in his life, the Redguard pondered the nature of these barons of move like this. He wondered about the barons of move like this and the impossibilities of their designs, how they were an advantage of Vivex that few warriors could compensate for. He wondered how any stone knowledge he'd absorbed had already been dealt with by a counter move that did not exist yet, and that Ansu Gurlet had no doubt trained in it. So, the Seven Daedra, the barons, taught Vivek how to counter every move imaginable, even moves that had yet to be performed. Then an eighth Daedroth came, and he was a demi-prince, called Fa Nui Hen, or the Multiplier of Motions known. Fa Nui Hen is a demi-prince in service to Boethia, and a patron of warriors. In the same meeting with Cyrus, Vivek performed a move taught to him by the demi-prince, which delivered eight wounds that appeared without mortal notice. And Fa Nui Hen said, Whom do you wait for? To which the Nechman's wife said, The Hortator. Go to the land of the Indoril in three months' time, for that is when war comes. The Demi-Prince directed the Nechman's wife to Mournhold, the seat of House Indoril, and the Hortator Indoril Nerevar. The war of which he speaks is the expulsion of the Nords from Morrowind in First Era 416. The Nords were weakened by power struggles at home, and Nerevar forged an alliance with Jumak Dwarf King, securing victory for the Chimer and Dwemer. This led to the formation of the First Council, and proved to be quite the diplomatic achievement for Nerevar, as the Chimer and Dwemer had always been adversaries, engaged in ceaseless territorial disputes, especially in the Ashlands of Vardenfell. Then the Barons and the Demi-Prince joined together into a pillar of fighting styles terrible to behold, and they danced before the egg and its learning image. Look, little Vec, and find the face behind the splendour of my bladed carriage, for in it is delivered the unmixed conflict path, perfect in every way. What is its number? The barons displayed their fighting styles before the egg, implanting the unborn Vivek with their martial prowess. The number Fan Nui Hen speaks of is very cryptic. It is said the number is the number of birds that can nest in an ancient Tibral tree, less free grams of honest work. But Vivek in his later years found a better one, and so gave this secret to his people. I'll level with you guys. I can actually feel the sanity leaking out of my ears as I read and reread this part. I have no idea what this secret number is, but maybe that's why I'm a mortal daedrologist, and Vivek is a demigod. My personal interpretation of this is that Vivek was shown infinite possibilities, more moves than any warrior could ever employ on the battlefield. But much like his rise to godhood, and his understanding of Kim, there is a particular number that matters most. Two. The warrior and the poet, the god and the mortal. One side of him is invincible and all-powerful, the other is humble, and capable of experiencing pain and loss and grief. For I have crushed a world with my left hand, he will say, but in my right hand is how it could have won against me. Love is under my will only. Once again, we see the dichotomy of Vivek, the walking, floating contradiction, 
On one hand is Vivek's destructive potential, on the other lies his weaknesses. Brutality and benevolence, sword and quill, gold and grey. Vivek exists as both a mortal and a god. Thus his ability to enact his will is profound, and he may exercise love or hatred freely and with great consequence. The ending of the words is Almsavi. Words are powerful, and in the age of the tribunal, no word is more powerful than Almsavi, for it encompasses Almalexia's maternal might, Sophocles's manifold mysteries, and Vivek's enlightened eccentricities, his carefully considered contradictions. The word Almsavi possesses the power of words and swords, and the divine power of the heart of Lorcan gives these words and swords their killing edge. And that brings us to the end of our analysis of Sermon 1. There is so much more I could say about this lesson alone, but we have 35 to go, so let's take it one step at a time. Thank you so much for watching and for coming on this esoteric journey with me. Trumora is a new channel, and I'm dedicated to seeing it grow so I can continue to tell these stories. If you'd like to support the channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. Please, only pledge if you can afford it. I've also started a Discord, so if you'd like to chat to me and anyone else interested in Elden Ring and Elder Scrolls, come join. Thank you so much again. My name's Drew the Daedrologist, you've been watching Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one.